Hello, everybody. Thank you guys so much for attending um, How to Find Your Perfect Niche. And so Jennifer and I um, are co-broker owners for Urban Provision Realtors. And we're super excited about uh, this webinar because it's something that we've been in the business a while and it's something that we always see that's a struggle for agents, whether they're new or seasoned. And it's not because they um, don't know what they're doing. It's just they don't have time. They're kind of putting out other stuff. So I want to make sure that you guys are going to be able to see my screen in just a second. I'm going to... Um, so you can see me. I don't want you seeing me. I've got no makeup on today. I've been working um, diligently on the computer. So I want to make sure you all can uh, see I, my screen. I can see your screen, Amy. Perfect. Awesome. And so Jennifer and I have been doing this, as I said, for a while. And we've talked with a lot of people all across the country about how do they find their perfect niche? What do they do to develop it? And that's what we want to kind of focus on today. So I'm going to go ahead and start, um, and whoops, I apologize. There we go. And so how to find your perfect niche. Oh, Mamie, make sure you expand it. And have you started to record? Sorry. I've already started recording. Okay. Is it showing full uh, screen on yours? Because it's full screen on mine. Uh, okay, that's fine. Okay. I'm making sure. All right. So how to find your perfect niche market is um they said we've kind of talked about that but your niche can be a lot of different things it doesn't have to be necessarily a geographic farm it doesn't have to be a, a golf course properties it doesn't have to be that it can be a lot of different things so we really kind of want to help you find that jennifer do you want to add on to that no i think you said pretty much anything you have to say and the question though that a lot of agents go is what is niche market um, or a niche market, depending on how you like to pronounce it, that's fine. And Jennifer found this great um, definition online. It's not how we, it's not how we say it in real estate, but this is the real definition. And that's what we're trying to break down to you is that don't go all haphazard and just throw money at everything. Be more specific. And so Jennifer, do you want to talk about the definition? Yeah, so, you know, the first definition is what we find in our house. Like, if your home was built in the 1990s, you have these little niches, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a segment of the market, and when we say segment, a distinct segment of the market. So it's not just going to be, like, a, a massive neighborhood, because that's not a niche. But, um, and we'll, we'll dive into, in a little bit, a little bit more of the examples of what we're talking about and how to, to um, to, to perfect it. Well, and the one thing that you have on this is number one on here is a, a place or position suitable for a person or a thing. So I thought that was great, which leads us to the next slide is when you try to reach everyone, you become special to no one. And I thought that was just um, amazing. Um, and we, if you think about it, it's common sense, but it's just something for us to think about. Can you guys still still see my screen is full view? So I want to make sure. Yeah, I can. Okay. I want to make sure. All right. So, so what's your biggest advice on this slide to somebody? Uh, my biggest advice is everyone says, and I'm, I'm going to use social media for an example. Everyone says you have to be on Facebook. You have to be on um, Instagram. You have to be on Twitter. You have to be on Snapchat, you have to be on everything. So you go, so an agent or just a person goes out and creates a, um, an account on every platform and doesn't use them well. So then you're not using them well and no one pays attention to you. So that to me kind of parlays into what we're gonna talk about is if you hone in on an area or a group, then people are gonna start to listen because you're gonna do it well. And then don't worry about everything else. If you casually get business because you got noticed, then great. But work, focus on a specific segment of the market. So what she's saying is that you can't be the super human and be awesome at everything. Nobody is. Um, unless if you are perfect like that, oh, I really want to meet you. Because, um, But is, I think, 
a lot of us get in this business and we get told so many things from so many people, even when we're seasoned, that, oh, we should be doing this, we should be doing that. And it goes back to you and I have always focused on, you know, marketing and, you know, marketing specifically to your niche market. Um, however that, and don't worry about all of these other things if it doesn't fit your marketing plan. And we've always focused on that. And that's what we try to focus on with our agents. Would you agree, Jennifer? I do. I do. Because I feel like when you aren't laser focused, you have an opportunity to what I call get distracted by sparkly objects and you're not doing yourself any favors or, I mean, at the end of the day, your goal is to make money and to be profitable and to be successful. And if you're being distracted and pulling in different areas, you're not going to be any of that. And I'm going to give the scenario, which she just kind of talked about as an addition is when I got into real estate, there was really not the training that you guys have now. And so they were, basically the managers of the office would say, it's like throwing spaghetti at the walls. Hopefully something sticks. And they would mm -hmm. tell you all these marketing ideas and they would tell you, you have to do them all. And, you know, and you'll get your niche market. Da, 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 da. And you were just chasing the spaghetti strings falling down the wall because you had no idea what you were doing. So this mm -hmm. goes back to what sets you apart from the competition. What makes you, you, and why do they want to work with you? And so I, I kind of, Jennifer and I are so similar, but I love this about, she used one of my favorite sayings um, um, in a great drawing, because I'm going to have to steal this um, one, because I always joke and say they're not this maybe smartest Crayola in the box, um, or that they're not the sharpest pencil in um, and I will use that to kind of say, and not in business, but just personal. And so I loved this number one figure, but then it also made me sit back and think is, do I set myself enough apart from the competition? And I have, and we'll get to that um, in just a little bit of kind of the three things that I feel I bring to the table that... Um, it took me a while to learn what skills. And if you're new in here, a lot of agents will say, what sets me apart? Well, I haven't even had experience yet, but I always go back and say, you have work experience or you have life experience. What makes you more equipped maybe than another person? So I'll give you an example of one is, um, people that relocated a lot and they were the trailing spouse. So they're used to all the ins and outs of a trailing spouse, how to be empathetic. So maybe they, their niche could be working with Relo or expats and it didn't, they never had a real estate license. They maybe have not worked uh, previously because they were the trailing spouse, but you have certain life skills that you can bring to set you apart from the competition. Jennifer, what do you think? No, I agree with that. And I feel like it, this is where, and we'll talk about it later, but you, you know, in Houston, what's there almost 36,000 realtors, Dallas, what, what 27, almost 30, mm -hmm. Austin, just at 13. So there's a lot of us on the ground pounding the pavement for only a sec, you know, so many properties to sell. So like just Amy said, you have to truly show how you're different than somebody else. And with that being said, one of the ways that's, um, is, and I've talked about this in marketing classes and Jennifer talks about this is becoming hyper local, being that hyper local agent. So I know you guys see the word blog on here and you've just freaked out. It's okay. Just breathe. Okay. Um, on me because yes, blog is great when you set up a website for search engine optimization. But some of you just know in your heart of hearts, you won't keep up with it because a blog requires consistency, content. Um, and so some of you may not be able to do that, but you can become hyper local other ways without doing a blog. I've known, um, and Jennifer and I know people across the country that they're not writers and not going to do a blog, but they have become hyper local 
by other social media streams, or Jennifer is awesome about talking about offline presence and how she converts her online to offline presence. And so um, that's just something I know that 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 word blog has become a oh four letter word in some agents' minds. Yeah. <laughs> but it's well, and scary. also people get so worried about typing the words and being a wordsmith and being a writer. Now we, like you, Amy just said, we have friends that do what's called blogs, video blogs, where they're out talking about their community, they're out talking about the na the neighborhoods, they're doing um, lifestyle uh, videos. And that could be essentially your blog. Um, it could be sharing information. You can be a source of a source. Now, I used to blog a whole lot more when I first got in the business and it's trailed off a little bit since we've opened our brokerage because I have other tasks at hand. But what I used to do is sit down one day a week, pick my one day a week time block, figure out that time block. That's my time to figure out what I'm gonna do for the week in a, in a sense of hyper local i did it sunday evening that worked for me i sat down i i looked at two or three things that i could say during the week that would help me keep my name out there and top of mind so you could write about it that day during that span you could think about who you're going to meet up with during that span and do it sometime during the week but if you plan then you don't have to think about it during the week when you're so busy all right, so here's a really good question. Okay, so let's say you want to do a blog or you want to do a vlog, which is the video blogging, or maybe you just want to concentrate on building your YouTube channel because that's the, the focus you want to do. Is we talked about, and, and Jennifer and I are both the, kind of the Sunday night girls, is that's when we would do our writing up and then we would schedule them to go out. So we would hit them out through email services or um, like Hootsuite. So it looked like we were posting more than we, I don't say posting more, but it was spread out. So we would take an hour at a time and just write up blogs. And then it was, we would time the content to go out based on maybe an right. event that was going on in our community, whatever it may be. And so, but our, those were based on kind of our marketing strategies of what, we wanted to create a niche markets. Now, hyper local for me was a little bit different when before Jennifer and I started the brokerage because I really worked my niche market is oil and gas people, engineers, attorneys, and accountants. And so I worked that market and really, so I created groups on Facebook for them when they all started going to Facebook. I had offline events to really connect with them. And uh, LinkedIn was not, believe it or not, a great niche for me to work with that type of client. But it kind of fell in my lap and I realized I have my niche and I didn't realize it. And it wasn't the niche I was going after. It was the looking at my client base that was coming in and the sphere of or referrals. I was like, wow, I have my niche. Now I need to focus on this. And again, that took me quite a few years in the business to figure that out because I tried other niche marketing, but again, I didn't have the tools that are now out there. So, you know, people will start doing blogs, but that's great. But maybe you uh, doing Facebook live streaming is your thing about community events. Um, maybe you are in an Instagram uh, guru and that's your, your thing. I have an agent, um, friend of mine and she's very into yoga. So she, her whole social media platform is about yoga newer to the business. And she is only like the people that she's relating to or people in the yoga business, but she's only pretty much using Instagram as her own, own way, only way to create that niche market. So you don't have to use all of them. No, you don't. But I, I always say whatever you decide to use, do it well and use it often or don't get off of it and find another platform. Yeah, good point. Very good point. All right. So this is a really good thing. When you're deciding on your niche market is how much do you want to make? What's the average sales price? 
and I say, how much do you want to make? Is it depends on your market areas. You may have the average sales price of three hundred thousand dollars. So obviously, you're not going to have to sell as many houses for what you want to make potentially. What's the turnover rate in my area in Houston? The there's a flat market between about three fifty and seven hundred thousand in most of our market areas. Not all of Houston, but a lot of them. There's always those pocket neighborhoods. But you have to be able to, I firmly believe, is you have to keep up with the trends and you may have to change that niche market uh, through your career. What do, you th what do you think, Jennifer? I do. I feel like, and below, we'll get to it, but it's not forced or natural. A, a niche market can't be forced. If it's forced, it's never going to work, right? It has to feel comfortable and natural and it has to be something you enjoy or just comes naturally to you and you'll excel at it if it's forced you're always going to be chasing it if it's natural it chases you that's correct good awesome way to, to phrase it and she talked about on here is what is the turnover rate so i know a lot of agents get into the business or seasoned ones that want to go after high end luxury property well how long are those properties staying on the market? What's the average list of sales price? How much outlay of money are you going to have to do to advertise to them as well as network? Because a lot of that kind of market is you have to actually network. Um, what is the word um, or the phrase where rubbing elbows? Is that the, the phrase I'm looking for? Right. Yeah. Okay. And then, but here's a great example of somebody in our area um, she did no social media marketing, did nothing. Um, she got in with when the foreclosure market came really strong and short sale. She gathered eight, she was a broker in our area, gathered agents, really focused on that as her niche market. And when that, and she didn't keep up with the trends of that niche market. And then the problem is they're now out of business. Mm -hmm. Because she was only getting leads from foreclosures and short sales. Well, it was great hot market for a while, but she didn't kind of start work changing her marketing to create a new niche market. Well, that goes to say that you, I mean, yes, everybody wants to pick one niche, but great. But you might be, you might need to pick two or three because one's going to dry up or one's not going to have as much business. And so you kind of need to work two different, two or three different ones. Right. And I think that's where don't you think agent struggle is with what's the pick. And it goes back to what you just said on there. It says, does it feel forced or natural? Mm -hmm. And so pick the ones that feel natural. So um, I made the comment about niche, niche marketing, but I also do stuff in the community and get involved in booster clubs. Um, I was the cheer mom and the volleyball mom. And, and so maybe you could say sports club or my niche market um, as well as the other ones, because those people do see um, what I do and they do come. So got a couple different ones and different marketing for each one. And I love the last one. Does your broker support it? That's a really good point. I've had a lot of brokers, um, and I'm going to speak for Houston since that's my area, is the brokers will say, if you want to geographic farm, you're only allowed this geographic farm. And you're not allowed. Do they, do, they, do they know how to guide you in marketing? I mean, do they support it, and do they understand how you can twist your marketing or sway your marketing to 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 grab attention or eyeballs from that group. I mean, you know, those are things you need to think about as well. Um, I remember, God, it was probably my first year or two in the business. And, you know, it was my first real estate company. And there was a, um, another a newer agent in the business. And she came in one day to the office and she was bragging. She was like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to be a luxury agent. I had my first, like, $1.2 million listing. And I'm like, great. And so she asked me why I wasn't happy for her. I said, I'm not happy that I'm not, I'm not, it's not that I'm not happy for you. It's just that you're going to spin your wheels 
for six months to a year on this one listing and spent countless of dollars for say, let's say 30,000 in commission or so. And I'm going to sell six, $300,000 homes in the same span and earn more money. Well, and that goes back, like you said, like we said, we, you've got to know that is I just had an agent tell me when I was up in Oklahoma city that she spent $35,000 on marketing this listing when it was a $1.7 um, property. And now they're pulling the listing from her. Mm -hmm. And so but she was trying to break into luxury farm and ranch. And I said, you know, you always have to think about how much you're spending for the rate of return to get into this niche market. Yeah. Right. I think we also said in a later slide, but I just don't want to forget it is know what your competition is. And we'll talk about that later um, uh, in your niche market. So Jennifer on this slide, Try. Yeah, so it, it, just in general, for someone to want to work with you, it, it, in order to build that trust, you need their commitment. You have to be sincere, so you need to have some sincerity to the transaction or to your marketing. You have to be reliable. You have to have some sort of integrity. You have to show co uh, competence and consistency. So kind of you need all of the uh, kind of everything around trust to gain the trust of the person you're trying to get the business from. So it's not like, oh, I'm a soccer mom, so I'm gonna be my niche of soccer moms. Just because you're a soccer mom, you don't build trust. You build trust from every the collaborative um, group of information there. Well, so if we have time, I wanna give like specific examples like you just said, like a soccer mom or other things that they can be doing to helping create that niche because we have it in a slide. But you made a competence about the comment about competence and integrity. And so our next um, webinar, we're going to be talking about how you can use data and stats to become the super human or superpowers in your thing. Because guys, you can try to say, I'm going to create this niche, but you've got to have stats to back you up when you're talking with a client. So, um, and so we, it, I think that's the name of it, Jennifer, just correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. It's, um, how to use, um, stats to become a realtor superhero. And that's where you gain that competency. And then I'm going to give you a couple of tricks tonight or today before we leave. And then we're going to give you a whole bunch more on that webinar of things that you can do to help establish that. So this kind of goes to, oh, well, there we go. Know your niche inside and out. So this goes to one of my tips, but Jennifer, I'll let you lead with it. Well, you have to, it's like, it's like if your niche is, say, condos, you better be walking into the condo buildings where, let's say you're downtown Houston or downtown Austin. You need to be going inside, doing previews. I mean, you have to know your, you can't just say, I'm going to sell downtown condos because it sounds appealing. You have to understand what um, amenities each building has because people are going to ask you those questions. I mean, it's, HOA a lot of time. it's like doing homework. Right. And what HOA restrictions, you know, um, right. what's um, the maintenance cost fees? What do they go for? Right. So when you have that client call, you can say, I know exactly the two buildings we go to. And then you look like the professional. Well, and then here's the other thing is if you develop your niche market well, other realtors that get to know you will send business your way for referrals. So like mm -hmm. I really don't do farm and ranch. I have a friend that anytime I get farm and ranch between here in San Antonio or, or Houston and Austin, he does farm and ranch. I don't work it. I don't know it. Um, I, I couldn't tell you any of the really ins and outs that well, besides knowing the contract, I wouldn't know really what questions to ask. So I refer it to him. Um, a, a guy in, um, Austin that Jennifer and I know, Jim, he's my property manager go to. If there's questions that maybe a landlord has, um, that I took a listing on a lease listing on, I have those 
people in my wolf pack or wolf squad as an agent. So that way I can tell them, listen, I'm not confident in this area. Here's somebody else to refer it to. Um, I've had, I worked with a lot of doctors for a while to do medical office space leasing. And I got kind of burned out because it was a lot of work um, for it. But that was one niche market I was going after. And I realized the return on investment of my time wasn't really worth it as much. So, but I learned tons about medical equipment, tons about, you know, build outs and all that. It was a great learning experience. But like I said, um, if referrals down in Galveston, I, you know, yes, I can work Galveston, but I'm probably going to refer it out to somebody that knows that market inside and out. Here's one market, niche market that people are really going after right now. I'm not sure about your area, Jennifer. The over 55 communities. Yeah, not so much. Um, here at more, it's multi generational. It's um, it's housing that um, has two, one roof, two kitchens, two living or uh, two bedroom sized sides, and one living space. Okay, so it's a little bit different. Well, that goes back to our comment: is knowing the different market trends in your different area. Mm -hmm. Because like multi, you know, family housing, you need to also know the lending issues that could come up with that if they need to get loans uh, over 55, same thing. So maybe something that we could do if you guys are interested is questions to ask when you're dealing with specific niche markets. Um, it's like do many webinars on that um, of questions to ask, questions to ask the listing agent if you're helping a buyer and that way you get competent. Here's one thing that when you, we say inside and out, this is something that I luckily got told when I was new to the business. And I thought it was, I kind of poo-pooed it away, but I still say it as an instructor. Pick one area that you're wanting. So when I got into the business, I lived in a very, it was a starter home. My husband and I have not even gotten married yet. And they're like, well, work your neighborhood, work your neighborhood. I'm like, I don't want to deal with $100,000 clients. You know, I, I, I just I don't want to work with them. I don't want to deal with it. And it wasn't because there's nothing wrong with $100,000 buyers. It's just I had a certain amount of money that I needed to make to replace my previous income at a job. So I knew I needed to work a different price point. So I did focus on that. But. Everybody was, work your neighborhood, work your neighborhood. Well, sometimes people in your neighborhood may not be as conducive of wanting to work with you because they know you as a neighbor. But what this lady told me is, she's like, you go to any open house in an area that you want to get into. Learn the, the floor plan, especially in master plan communities. She also said, if there's a broker caravan, back in the days, that's what we did. You go in. If there's new construction that's competing in the same price point, you go learn everything you can about new construction that's competing against the area you're looking at. You run numbers to see who has the market share. Is it worth me even getting into this neighborhood? And so that's what we're talking about, learning the niche inside and out, is you've got to be able to run numbers. And we'll talk about that further in our webinar next time. All right, so this is a great um, one. So it says... Uh, solve your client's problems. Make it possible yeah. instead of impossible. So, Jennifer? Well, I feel like when a client starts a search or says, I want to buy a house, they don't start a search. They go, I want to buy a house. They don't know where they want to buy. They tell you, I want X and Y and Z, and they end up buying A, B, and Z. So, <laughs> it's, <Yeah. laughs> it's your job as an agent to make all these impossibilities and issues to solve their problems. And when I say solve their problems, know your market so well when they say, I want this or I want that. Like you're asking the right questions so you can guide them to that. And let me give you an example. Um, I grew up Conroe Woodlands area. I live in Austin now. We have a lot of people moving from that area to the Austin area. 
I grew up around green and trees and tall um, pine trees. And I do not want to live in North Austin because to me, it reminds me of Houston. It's concrete. It's strip center after strip center. So whenever someone from Houston area contacts me and says, or even Dallas, and they say, hey, I'm moving to the area, I, t I ask one question. Tell me about the area you live in now and why do you like it? Why do you like it? Why do you like it? And they tell me why, like, because it's green and we have parks and we have this. And then, so then I'm going to sway them one direction or another because now I know they're not going to like one area or the other, but I've gotten to know my areas so I can sway those people. And I've solved the problem of them looking all over the area and getting so done frustrated. Good point. Um, and when we say sway, please know that we're not, you know, saying steering one way or the other. It's more that we know that they're not going to like it because they like green spaces and that area doesn't necessarily have green spaces or doesn't have the parks right next to it that they were used to having and they mm -hmm. want it. So, and so here's another niche market that I just thought about that. Um, we talked about the soccer moms, but the, um, you talked about kind of the active lifestyle and active lifestyle is becoming at least in the Woodlands area and Houston area, I'm seeing a huge change in that is that people are downsizing from their bigger homes. Um, if they can sell them right now, wanting condos um, to leave, um, to be able to turn the key, walk away. And they want um, active lifestyles so they can run running trails and stuff. And this has been generational. So it's not, um, just one generation. It's a lot of different mixed generations. So I think we're seeing a lot of that kind of movement. So it, could that be a niche market for you? Maybe you're involved in. So, um, I, before we, we go further, I, I just had that thought is, um, Nick, Nick, Jennifer. Yeah. She created a niche market. Um, she had been in the real estate business, the affiliate sides, the, um, and, she got into real estate, got her license when she decided to get out of the affiliate vendor side. And she really worked her niche market was um, Ironman people. And then all of her open houses were focused on, you know, um, that she would drive by with her video of a Go, GoPro of her videoing, um, driving by on her bicycle of this is the what it looks like in Livermore, California. This is my going to be at my open house on Sunday. And then she had a higher price listing. And then she had a local vendor donate a bike. And then people mm -hmm. that showed up at the open house, there was a drawing for it. And then she did a big social media post. So she said, I already had that niche market because it's something I was, I already knew Livermore because I lived there for so long. I already had created an online sphere of influence as well as an offline and so she kind of tied them together, which is kind of like the next slide is let's rethink, you know, how will you spread the word? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, I mean, you have to, I, I hate the word, the words, I think outside the box, but you have to rethink in today's society. We all live and I'm going to, I know Twitter has gone to more than 140 characters, but we live in a 140 character society. If you're not um, fine tuning your message and getting your message out quickly, you're going to miss people. And you think you have to think about smart and something outside the box. And I hate to use that word, but you do. And yeah, that's, and I rethink what works. And I always think on this one, let's rethink is I always put myself in the mind of the consumer. Would I like it when I was going for my niche market? When, as I said, I went for a niche market, failed, you know, fell flat on my face and then it kind of got dropped in my lap. And so, but even now in any marketing choice I'm doing with my current niche market is would they like that? Um, and, and that helps me decide, okay, this is, backing my marketing plans and working to that niche market that I've created. Well, something that I was chatting with one of our agents and um, I asked her cause her niche market was her neighborhood. That was her, it's going to be her niche. 
and she has a few um, mom friends that are some of her best friends. And I said, look, why don't you do this? Why don't you create a couple of different marketing pieces and go to your best girlfriends because those are the girls that should be telling you, no, don't do that. Yes, do that. And say, look, if you got this marketing piece, what would you think? How would you respond? Would you like it? Would you think I was competent? Like ask those questions because those are the people that should be in your cheerleaders and should be in your corner telling you, no, don't do it because it looks like crap or that looks amazing. That's going to look great. Right. And, and that's where you have to because, and as I said, I keep saying is niche marketing is, so I'm going to pick on um, Scott, one of my, our friends. And we talked about blogging earlier and Scott bless his heart. And I can say that because he's from North Carolina. And he's, he told me a couple of years ago when I first met him at a couple of, um, meetings, and actually it's been a few years ago. And Scott told me, he says, Amy, I'm not going to blog. I don't have the time. Um, I don't have the energy. I'm not going to do this, but I'm somewhat newer to the business. And we kind of talked over dinner one night with a group of us. And I said, you're a golfer work the golfing niche. And I just saw him a couple of months ago in Wilmington, North Carolina, and his business is through the roof because all he focused on was not blogging, but he did community lifestyle and it was focused around golfing. And he also used the catchphrase in Pinehurst, North Carolina, which I didn't know that they had that catchphrase. But it would be anybody that answer, called, um, like a hotel or a restaurant, they always answered with, it's a beautiful day in Pinehurst. And he said, why can't I, it's not trademark, why can't I use it? So anytime he would do a, um, a post on Facebook with like a picture as he's driving his kids to school, he would do it, it's a beautiful day in Pinehurst. So what he was doing is branding that niche, and normally they were things that around a golf course. His how um, his office is all um, done in golfing, but he was an ex pro golfer, or I, I'm not sure what his status was on the golfing. But he says, "I it's a passion, and I have a huge sphere of influence. Why shouldn't I be using it?" But he's like, "I do not, I cannot blog." And I said, well, "Then go hyper local these ways," and he's done. So he had to rethink of his strategy, and it's been working for him um, very well, actually. So let's go to keep tabs on your competition. I yeah. said it earlier, you got to. Well, and I'm not, I don't suggest this to do what they're doing. I would never tell you to be just like your competitors because you'll never stand out um, from the competition. You need to know who's in your market, what they're doing, because when you start talking to people and then another homeowner or mom or whomever says, Oh, well, do you know? So-and-so you need to talk intelligently about that other competitor in a nice way. So it looks like you're a true professional. Well, not just that I'm going to add on to that is that you've got to be careful. What you say is about a competitor is that you could be in violation of the code of ethics for article 15 of the code of ethics. So if you have facts about and figures about the other person, you can say factual information. But when we talk about the competitors is you should know those because we talked about earlier, I was going to go into a, uh, a market that when I, it was, I was probably maybe five years in the business and it was a hot market. It was way too far away from the woodlands for what I wanted to be driving. And it was, Leads were probably not going to come to the office brokerage firm that I was at. It was going to go to the other franchise office close by. But I was darn, you know, determined that I was going to own that geographic farm mm -hmm. because I had sold a couple in there. And I was like, Shh. and I was a little too high fluting for myself. And then once I ran the numbers, I said, I can't compete. This one agent has 30%. Actually, she had like almost 40% market share. And I said, I can't compete. It doesn't make sense for me. And so, but I had to look up her competition numbers to know where did I sit? Could I, you know, take over or not? 
um, on that one. And then here's the next one for you guys is identify how to reach your audience. So we've talked about this a couple of things, but it may be different. So I'm going to give you a couple of four instances, depending on your marketing plan. So we talked about the soccer mom earlier. You brought that up, Jennifer, right? Yes. All right. Believe it or not, one of the ways when I was a cheer coach, um, I was selling real estate, but I cheer coached for my oldest daughter is I, and I tell this and it was some of the simplest and cheapest ways for me to kind of talk with people and it, and it talks about learning competency and knowing your market is I would set them up in the MLS system and actually I wouldn't set them up. I would go and look up the tax rolls to find their address. Then I would set it up where it would automatically email me with the actives and the pendings and the solds to email just me. So when I would see them at the next football event or whatever it may be, I was like, oh, I just saw a new house come on the market uh, in your neighborhood. Oh, I just saw that one sold. Um, and I still use that to the day, this day. It's a really cheap way, but it keeps me feeling competent in my sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, I think that I don't do... Uh, when I reach my audience, I reach them a little bit differently. It's to me, it's not about stats. It's about how we have that common connection. And then I, then I, then we end up in a real estate conversation after that. But my, my end is something completely non real estate. Okay. Sorry. Um, Are you there? It just, Somebody's trying to call in on it. So, all right. But so there's different ways, but when we get to the next one, when we talk about stats, we'll talk about other ways to market for those. But I kind of give you an ideas on using the MLS data, but also using, you know, community lifestyle events, um, getting involved in your sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. And then, so just some ideas for you guys. All right, so prepare your unique signature speech. Yeah, I think that you, everybody needs to have, I'm going to call it elevator speech. You need like a two second, three, four, three, couple second speech about you as an individual, about the market, um, about your niche, about what's going on. You need a couple signature speeches that you are the polished. You know how to, what to say, how to say it. You're not chirping over your words. Um, right. And it's, so somebody it's be asked in the chat room is, what's kind of my signature speech? I'm very, um, I don't want to say organic. I don't know if that's the best way to say it, but I let the conversation kind of flow. But if they ask me, what do I bring to the table? Uh, but I normally kind of throw it easily into conversation just because I'm low pressure on people, but, um, believe it or not, I am, but the three things, and it took me a while to identify what those were is marketing, negotiating and statistical analysts analytics on their property. And, but it took me a while to figure out what do I bring to the table? What am I unique about? And that goes back to our previous slide is what makes you stand out from all the other crayons in the box. Right. Here's a niche market. Somebody put in the chat room, which I wanted to bring up is, and I just actually coached an agent up in Oklahoma city about it. Her passion is rescue dogs. And so we talked about it. We did her game plan. She had been in the business probably 30 years. And she just messaged me last night saying, because I'm focusing on the rescue and not doing all this marketing on everything else. She said on the rescue dog, she's like, I'm getting like, she's like, I got five leads this week just off that. Not from sphere of, not from people I knew, but that just were checking my posts and stuff. And she said, Amy, I can't tell you the last time I got five leads in a week that and she's like, when I'm saying leads, like we're already out looking kind of leads. 
And I said, you know, and that's what we've been talking about is find that niche. Um, so if it's your thing, um, for dog rescuing, whatever it may be, I've gotten a lot of leads from our, um, my, it's not a niche market. It's my social object, but just from marketing about, um, scuba diving and flying the plane, um, of my husband flying the plane. So I've gotten a lot of leads there. It's not a niche market. It's just me talking about my social object. Right. So with that being said, then let's talk about the different types of niches out there. Um, so you've got the geographical one that we've kind of talked about geographic farming. And I don't know about you, Jennifer, did you ever do that when you started in the business? Geographical farming. Um, I did a little bit. I didn't do like just listed, just sold postcards. I didn't do anything like that. I got sucked. I'm going to call it sucked in to Brian Buffini, like the, um, and I sent stuff out to a farm. It was, it just, it was awful. Um, so yeah, I did. Um, it didn't turn out very well for me because I, it just didn't work. Well, the reason why I asked that about the geographical one is because that's what I got told is you send out, you know, 500 postcards to your geographic farm and, and that those rules have really changed. But if you're going to work your geographical niche market, maybe look into next door, but also again, know the stats because when I moved into this new neighborhood that I moved what four years ago, I guess, I said, okay, I'm going to go back old school and I'm going to really work it old school style. And I want to see it, how it works old school versus new school. Since I'm in a new um, geographic niche, I am glad I did not really spend the money because our neighborhood like flattened out. So I could have spent this money, um, a lot of it and not gotten anything out of it. So instead I just do it, I do it more offline, working the geographical of, you know, hosting parties or going to, you know, a book club events and just doing it offline networking to work my geographic versus just inundating them. Um, and I do work next door for that, but I know that the market, I don't want to, it's not my main focus because of the um, turnaround times right now on that one. Um, in demographic and niche markets, we talked about like the over 55 community. Yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I was going to say, you have to be cautious of what you say because you know, we have to, you have to say a message that people are going to, it's going it, to, it needs to be like legs. It needs to like, someone needs to continue the conversation. If you're going to do something online. Yep. And on next one. Yeah. And so a lot of times then like next door is I'll say, Hey, here's a, the one I recommend to a client and then I'll then private message to them and say, Hey, let me know if you have any, if that one doesn't work and doesn't respond, let me know and I'll take them off my list, but I've got other ones. Just let me know. And that kind of starts the conversation going. And then de demographic niches. We talked about kind of over 55 as one niche market that we're seeing. Jennifer brought up the multifamily niche market. That's really kind of hitting di again, different areas. Um, ones that are based upon style. So Jennifer, what do you, what's, when you say that, what's your thoughts on that one? Well, the style is like a colonial style or, um, um it could be like, um, traditional or it could be, or they want to post some water and, or whatever. Right. Okay. Or it could be, um, let me hold on just a second. It could be new construction. It could be condo or townhome, or it could be farm and ranch. It's based on style. It could be a tiny house or mid century modern. Oh, wait, that's a niche market that we hadn't talked about. And I actually really spent some time looking into the tiny home movement. And then once I realized it's a, the amount of time I would spend for the price point. Uh -huh. It was not necessarily, I was just interested in it for me personally, but yeah, I know Austin's starting to have a lot of those popping up. I know Houston and Conroe north of it, um, all the way out to Sealy west of town. We're starting to get some tiny home communities too in Houston, but research them. 
um, know um, the loans on these too, because that some are saying it's just like a mobile or uh, manufactured home, mobile home. And so you've got to make sure you know that goes about knowing your competency for your niche market. And then features. I'm, I'm going to take this, when I say features, I'm thinking lifestyle features of they are major joggers or they are golfers or they're boaters or mm -hmm. they want all, they um, are not wanting to walk upstairs and so they want all bedrooms down. They, you know, feasibility of getting to um, the, the airports, those type of things. Yeah, you could, or it could be divorcing couples, it could be uh, millennials, it could be tech savvy, it could be a widow or a veteran, or... Um, well, and I'm laughing but, said the divorce. For a while, my niche market was divorce. I became the divorce queen with all of my, almost all my sphere of influence. And it was well, because you get two or three transactions out of it, right? Yeah, exactly. But I didn't purposely go after it. It just kind of fell in my lap, and they realized they could trust me because of my competency and how well I could be confidential. And so it just really kind of fell in my lap. All right, so strive to be a data nerd. We've talked well, about Well, before we go on, I want to mention that there's a okay. handout, and there's a type types of niches and, and a handout on the right side as a PDF. So download that because we give you kind of a whole list of when we talk about the geographical demographic, um, when we talk about these niches, we give you a whole list to go through. So don't forget to download that before you leave. Now go ahead. No, no, I thank you for mentioning that. But Jennifer took the time to type this up on um, niches and put it in the handout. So when they it's done that you guys can make sure you download that. Um, and you know, it's a good handout for a reference tool and then strive to be a data nerd. Yeah. Um, like who's selling. We talked about that. Um, average days on market list price versus sold price. How many units are still active? In your MLS, you can set up a hot sheet for an area, a zip code, a subdivision, whatever it is. Set yourself up hot sheets and get yourself sent the data, emailed to you, not emailed, just click in the MLS. Most of us in Texas are using Matrix, and you can set yourself a residential hot sheet, and you can change that hot sheet to say for what your niche is. Um, but my big beef with a lot of agents is whenever they say, well, how's the market? Oh, it's good. Your um, the answer should never be good. Mm -hmm. Because that tells me you haven't done your research. And I totally agree. And that's, you know, why we talked about last month, that month of inventory, how, how critical knowing that month of inventory to answer that question is how's your market. And then you can say, you know, per month of inventory in this price point, so definitely um, on that one. Um, all right. So are you ready to go on the next one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you being effective with your clients and are, are they connecting with you socially? Yeah. So what this is talking about is um, Dunbar's number. So there's this number, a, max, a maximum number of relationships a person can maintain. And it has... It is proven that a person cannot maintain more than 150 relationships and, and engage with them. So if you have a Facebook with 500 to 700 people, you're not engaging with those people like you should if you only had 150 people. So are you being effective with your contact? So the average user has 200 friends. Amy has a lot more. I had over a thousand and I have scaled back extensively because I want to engage with my people on social media and the average real search closes six to seven transactions a year. So if the, if the average realtor and the average Facebook user, you're missing out on some people because you're not connecting with them socially. Yep. And then, you know, come back and revisit our webinar that we recorded about, um, engaging online versus offline because we really go through this a lot more um, of how we, and as I said, Jennifer does it a lot better than I do 
And I just know that um, I'm not as good at, um, as she is about it. So old school approaches. All right. So Jennifer, calling them on the phone, calling for sale by owners, calling terminateds. Yep. Yeah, calling ca calling your friend down the street. Hey, how's it going? It doesn't have to be real estate. It, it's just the conversation starter can be something else. Picking up the phone and talking to people. Um, going to coffee, going to lunch, sending an old school handwritten note card to your people in your niche. Um, all right. And then. Um, and these are just a few. But, uh -huh. but, I said these are just a few, um, but new school is social media. And we've talked about that today because that's what we live in a society today is social media and then uh, video and then drone photography. And I will say if you're not really good at using drone photography, drone uh, photography or video or video, don't do it in your business until you've perfected it or ask some or, or pay someone else just to do it because you don't want to have shaky video or unpolished video because it's a re representation of you and how you're going to do business. Good point. Very good point. And then, um, but again, that goes back to one of our other webinars we did is like we have social media marketing guidelines of, and then we give you kind of step-by-step -step checklists of, you're going to be working in this niche market or if you're going to be working in this social object to create your niche market and then we give you step-by-step -step checklists in that social media marketing um, webinar. So thanks for attending guys. And I think I answered all the questions that were in there. And so again, remember download the handout, Jennifer, what else do we want to remind them of? Yeah, just we have another webinar on in October. I think it was the 17th. Um, if you have questions, you can email them to um, webinars at urbanversion.com about this session. The session will be uploaded um, within about 24 hours on our website. And if for some reason you weren't able to download the handout or need it, just email us at that email. And we'll make sure you get a copy of it. Okay, awesome. Sounds great, guys. Any other questions? Thank you guys for attending and make sure you attend our next webinars. We'll be doing another webinar in um, November and we'd love to hear any feedback about what future webinars that you want to um, attend. And you can again, email those to us and let us know because we try to give you guys good content and kind of just personal experiences. So thank you guys all for attending and have a fabulous day. Thanks.